It's now my pleasure to introduce our luncheon keynote speaker, General James E. Haas Cartwright, U.S. Marine Corps retired. He's the immediate former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Cartwright is currently the inaugural Harold Brown Chair for Defense Policy Studies at CSIS. A Marine aviator who started in Phantoms. He commanded at the squadron, the group, and the Marine aircraft wing levels. I had the pleasure of working for General Cartwright two times on the Joint Staff. No officer had more influence on the way the Joint Force of today is shaped, developed, and procured than him. From joint warfighting requirements to strategic systems, from BMD to cyber, no one could synthesize information and put important ideas together like General Cartwright. His influence spanned administrations. He championed many of the most successful concepts, policies, and systems that we have in place today. Some of his best work is highly classified, but several of us know what he did and that it mattered mightily. I'm told that he's also the last officer who served continuously on active duty who was initially drafted. Could be a movie line in there. Again, it's my pleasure to introduce the only Marine ever to serve as the commander of the Strategic Command, the eighth Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Haas Cartwright. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Um, I've, I've been in these forums once or twice before, and when you come down here, it's uh, like old home week oftentimes. You run into a bunch of people that you've known over the years and whatnot. Most of them have stories about you that you probably don't want to go public. Um, and they gave me 20 minutes, and that, that's not even half the time that I need just to tell daily stories. But, um, but I did run into a couple of people coming in here that brought back a couple of memories that are good memories. They have exceeded the statute of limitations, so they're memories that I can share. And I, I'll share one story before I jump into the the talk here, but uh, I was a uh, brand new captain in the Marine Corps, um, in, in, uh, and at that time it was F-4s, and we went to this Air Force base for an exercise um, called uh, Red Flag, and uh, we you know, went through the first few days of trying to make sure we could get to the range and get back without getting in trouble, and uh, Marines tend to get lost every once in a while. And uh, so we went to the club to celebrate the fact that we hadn't been thrown out of the exercise yet. Uh, I, I'm not sure you know, how it happened, but somehow the base commander's wife was offended. Um, I don't know what was said. I can't remember. Um, but, but we were sent back to our quarters. <laughs> and uh, the next morning, the CO of the squadron uh, said, OK, 6 o'clock, everybody in uniform, uniform inspection, uh, be there, or you're toast. So we thought, six o'clock in the morning? You gotta be kidding me. Uh, uniform inspection, we were on deployment. Who's got a uniform, you know? So a couple of us that were enterprising during the night might have snuck into all of the field grade officers' booches and stole enough uniform that there wouldn't be enough for them to put one together. They were not happy with us the next morning. <laughs> um, and and I, the funny part about this, I guess years later, is when you see somebody that was part of that raid, uh, and you go, there's just an instant bond when you walk by, <laughs> number one. Number two, as it turns out, um, this Air Force commander that was the base commander at the time subsequently made flags, sub subsequently made four stars. and. Uh, 
to this day, his wife and I are great friends. I don't understand what's wrong with this. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of what we do is built on relationships, built on the relationships, particularly in this organization between industry, academia, the military, um, national security apparatus, all of those things. We have that common bond. Many of us have moved in different places here, whether we were in the military and then moved over to the to the uh, private industry side of the equation or over to the academic side, whichever uh, happens to occur. But we continue to come back because something draws us, and that, that is service. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you wear a coat and tie or a uniform, the, the idea of service is something that is common amongst all of us. Um, we are in an unprecedented time, and everybody that gets up here will tell you that, but 10 years of war under our belt there's really no precedent for that uh, in this country. We generally think about going off and we stay until it's over and then we come home. And that's just not been the case in this conflict. Um, this conflict is really the first big and extended conflict of the all-volunteer force. The fact that for me, um, I came into the military as a draftee out of college um, you know, is a little bit of a, an enigma in, a, in discontinuity to some extent, um, but the reality of this is is that um, this all-volunteer force has been incredible. We have not yet taken an all-volunteer force through a downturn. When resources become stretched thin, when hard choices are made, when potentially the quality of service, the day-to-day -day spare parts, availability of flight time, steaming hours, whatever it is, um, has been drawn down. When you take a, you know, E-7 as an example, um, that is Army or Marine, and say, okay, you need to go to the pistol range and qualify, or you need to go to the rifle range and qualify, and somebody stands there and tells them, with five rounds, lock and load, and they look at them like, you got to be kidding me. I've spent my whole life using this weapon, and now I'm treated like this. Garrison reality. Uh, those are tough, tough leadership issues. Those are tough re uh, retention issues. Um, we have an Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard that is unparalleled in the history of the world right now with their skills. Um, and, and how we retain that and how we entice people to stay is something that we have really not done in the past. We have really been a service in a mindset of we will riff I don't need you, I need that dollar that pays you, so I'm gonna get rid of you and buy. And, and that was pretty much what happened. We don't wanna be in that in mindset. We can't be in that mindset and recruit and continue to recruit and retain the type of people that we have today if we approach those kinds of downturns in manpower in the same way we have in the past. When you look at what we are facing right now, for me and what I've been asked to, to address today, um, you know, there are three big levers here that we ought to be mindful of. One is strategy. Uh, the other one is the resource side of the equa equation. And the third is how, in fact, we're going to make those match up, which sometimes is called grand strategy when you're trying to match ends and means. On the strategy side of the equation, um, Every four years, we go through what is called the Quadrennial Defense Review. Um, we do that whether there's a change in administration or not. I'm not sure why. I think it's just to, to make sure that the pain is felt by everybody on a routine basis. But the reality is that when an administration comes in, we go through this cathartic event where we basically work our way through what is it we want to do in the name of a strategy. And most of the time, this is a real secret, so please don't let this out, it only changes about this much, but we change the names of everything. Um, we have been a force basically since probably midway through the Cold War of a two-theater construct. And that two-theater construct was one that prevented us from being blackmailed if we were fighting in one place and went to another. And so we said we had the ability to fight in two theaters simultaneously. Then somebody took us to task with analysis, and we said, well, almost simultaneously. 
And then we said, well, maybe what we really meant was 30 days separation between the fights. Then that went up to 45 when we figured out that the ships really couldn't steam fast enough to make it there in 30 days. Uh, and it went back down to 30 when we got 22 knot ships. Um, and then when we were actually tested here with an Iraq and an Afghanistan going simultaneously, we found out that it really wasn't the shipping, it was the ISR, it was the logistics, it was, in it, and it goes on and on. The fallacy of the two war scenario. It doesn't mean that we can't hold in one. It doesn't mean that we're going to allow ourselves to be blackmailed. But the reality is that we are not two simultaneous high-end fights. And the thought process was if you were, everything else would be a lesser included case. Somebody forgot about the long war. Um, so today we find ourselves, having gone through the QDR at the beginning of this administration, now trying to figure out how we're going to do a downsizing and what should be led by a strategy discussion. But the reality of anybody that's worked in this town, the one to the north of here, um, is that in a transition year, uh, if you ask the people who, who put the strategy together in the Office of Secretary of Defense to change it, you're basically asking them to admit they were wrong. So it doesn't change much, quite frankly. Um, and that's the conundrum that we find ourselves in right now. We just took a 480 some billion dollar reduction, which quite frankly, truth be told, we were gonna take anyway. It was already in the plan. It was just a question of when and how. Um, and so while we squeal a lot about that reduction and about how terrible it was, we were headed in that direction anyway. So that's the reality. We do not wanna talk about the next increments uh, we're willing to say the word sequester without saying that we're going to do anything different. Okay? Um, you know, and the reality out there, shoot, your crystal ball is as good as mine. Uh, given any given month, it, it looks like there's going to be a sequestration. And it doesn't look like there's going to be one. I don't know. But if you take it from a base in, in 10, 480 is about 11% reduction. Historically, we run 20 to 26% reductions after these kind of conflicts. That means we're about halfway there. If you think along those lines, at some point, you have to change the strategy or hollow the force. And left to our own devices, we would normally hollow the force because we just take a little bit more. Oh, I just need another 100 billion. I just need another 100 billion. I can take it here and not kill all programs because I know in a couple of years this will all be fixed and I don't want to lose anything that I've got now. Okay? The reality is that's a, that's, that is really a recipe for disaster. Um, now you, you, you can have your math and I'll have mine, but my sense right now is from where we are at about the 500 level, we got at least another increment of a couple hundred. Okay, so that takes us to about the 700, 750 level, and then we'll get another one after that. Um, I have faith in the Congress. Um, and, and that's the reality. The question is, are we going to have a strategy to fit it? Are we going to build a force where the quality of service is maintained at the level that we can attract the quality of people that we have today? That's a huge question. There are, there are activities going on out there that are trends in the way we fight and the way we do business. If you go back to the two world wars, the, the unit of merit was armies. Not the army, armies. And in, in Korea, the transition between Korea and Vietnam, it was divisions. Now it's BCTs. The reality is mobility, fires, give us the lethality to be in a lot of places that we couldn't have been before, and we've traded that mobility and fires for people. That's just the way it has been. And the same is true in the air, and the same is true on the sea. Um, but at some point here, we're likely to start to rub up against some really hard decisions. I don't think in the next five years you're going to see us going from BCTs to battalions. And that's 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 a little ways off. It's not unrealistic, but that's a little ways off. But the reality here is that our units are getting smaller. 
they're more lethal, more capable, more, more maneuverable. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how many of them we need. That's going to be the decision. How many wings, how many BCTs, how many MEFs are we really going to have, and to do what? Okay. Today we talk about air-sea battle, you know, as something that um, to some is becoming the holy grail um, of how we're going to do business. It's neither a doctrine nor a scenario, and uh, it's trying to be all things to all people, and it's a bit of a problem for us. Um, the worst part about it from a political sense is we have two kind of really word problems out there right now. Air-sea battle is demonizing China. That's not in anybody's best interest. And we're pivoting to the Pacific. Really poor choice of words, unfortunately, because basically the rest of the world interprets that as you're turning your back on them and disengaging, and that's not our intent. But that's what's been interpreted from the word pivot. And it's not like we haven't been in the Pacific. Um, so the question becomes, how do we explain ourselves now that we are doing air-sea battle and pivoting away from the rest of the world? And we have to come to grips with that. We have to start to think about what the strategy is. As you start to look at the resource consequences, the first and most uh, concerning is the quality of service. In other words, what are we going to be? How are we going to resource it? How are we going to make sure there, in fact, are spare parts on the flight line, so to speak, to be able to do the job that we need to do? And I, especially now when I'm not walking around in uniform, but I get to visit places, I'm hearing all of the stories about shortages, about what they don't have, what they need, etc. We have to be careful. We have to be mindful of what it is we're doing. My assessment, and, and please, it's certainly open to interpretation, is that somewhere around the 750, if you don't change the strategy, we will, we will run square into a massive disconnect here. If you take another 200 billion out of this budget, we're going to run into a problem if we don't start thinking about a different strategy. Or we don't start acknowledging the realities of the world that we're actually moving into rather than the one we've been in. One of those realities is that we are now an occupation force. We're equipped as an occupation force and we're trained as an occupation force. When you go to battle by getting up in the morning in your compound, getting into your armored vehicles, go out and patrol and return to your compound at night, that is an occupation force. Okay? It is a very heavy force, very heavy. Too heavy to move by air. Is that what we want to be when we grow up? We're about to spend hundreds of billions of dollars recapitalizing. To what? To what? What are our ground forces going to look like? What are our air forces going to look like? What are our naval forces and maritime forces going to look like? Are we going to build an occupation force for the last war? What's the next war that we want to prepare for? Is it the air sea battle world? Somebody has to declare that, otherwise anything you buy is okay. It can't be judged. And quite frankly, there's probably a lot of contractors that like that idea, but, but the reality here is we need to understand for this country what it is we want out of our national security apparatus and out of the military. And if we want to be an occupation force, which there's nothing I'm hearing from Washington that would confirm that, then we recapitalize what we have. If we have aspirations to be something else, then what is it? And what equipment is appropriate for that something else? And in the interim, while you don't have resources and you're moving in that direction, what does it look like? What, what are the things that we do today that ought to be replaced? What are the implications of what we have seen in the unmanned side? You know, uh, when I irritate my favorite uh, Air Force, about their bomber, um, you know, it's not that it's manned or unmanned. That, that's almost irrelevant. The problem for me is that you are building an airplane, and I'll, I can take this to any other service. I'm very comfortable talking about the DDG-1000, and, and, and we can go on and on from there. But the, the question here is, um, you're basically at the human edge of performance in an airplane today. 
the airplane is completely compromised by the presence of a person. You can't pull the G's, you can't do the time on station, you can't get the strategic reach, you can't do any of those things with the person. Unless you invent things like, oh, I'm going to tank en route in a tanker that can't survive in a hostile environment. Uh, doesn't have a base to get gas anyway. But, but what is it we're trying to do here, and why are we keeping the person in the loop? When you think about unmanned vehicles, okay, and I, I'm going to pick on air right now, but, but I'll, we're happy to be an equal opportunity picker here. Um, it's, it's not the cost of the person in the vehicle. That's almost negligible. It's the performance of the vehicle without the person. That's number one. Because, because we've, we've had U-2s since the 60s. They fly 22 hours, but the pilot only lasts nine. Okay. The same is true of a predator or a reaper or, or, or you pick your flavor here. Um, 24 hours on station is not a bad time on station time, especially at somewhere in the neighborhood of four or $500 an hour rather than four or $5,000 an hour. But the performance side of the equation completely eliminates the person being in the vehicle. That's fine. That's the issue. And oh, by the way, when we go home, when we're in peacetime, you're not still flying that vehicle the same number of hours per month because the pilot needs to be trained. You fly at zero because all of the training is done virtual just like the flying is done. So your operations and maintenance costs go significantly down in peacetime. Now, we don't want that for some reason. Um, I grew up as a fighter pilot. I love being in the cockpit. But this is the reality of the world we're in. You know, um, we've got to start to find where the leverage is. The leverage is in systems like that that can exceed the performance of the human being can be out there either longer than a person can last in harsher environments than a person can survive, doing things that a person just generally can't do in that environment. And then when they're not needed, you park them until you need them, quite frankly. And you don't pay those exorbitant overhead costs. I mean, do you want a smaller force with weapon systems that only have marginal space for improvement? which is where we are today in aviation, where we are today in space, where we are today on the sea, where we are today under the sea. Okay? Do you want a 5% improvement in performance? Give me $100 billion. Okay? And oh, by the way, that 5% margin that you just bought will long be gone before you ever field that weapon system. On the contrary, the unmanned systems have huge upside potential, huge upside potential, both from the standpoint of their mission space, from the standpoint of their performance space. All of those things are only limited by computational power, which is changing every 18 months according to Moore's law. Those are the kinds of things we need to start thinking about. I'm not preaching unmanned. I'm preaching the idea of where is the upside potential in lethality, mobility, strategic reach, depth, the ability for fires to get at you 24-7, any kind of weather, any kind of strategic depth. That's what we need. In the Gulf War, at the end of the first Gulf War in the last few weeks, the Air Force brought precision to the battlefield. It fundamentally changed warfare. Fundamentally changed warfare. The first few days of the second Gulf War evolution, the rush hour traffic in Baghdad did not slow a bit while it was under attack because they knew they weren't going to get hit. Only the targets we aimed at were going to get hit. I mean, it's, it's a stark picture when you look at a, at a moving picture of Baghdad going through that first strike, and rush hour traffic isn't diverted, it isn't even slowing down. And nobody's getting off the streets because they know. They know. Okay? And we took the night away after the first Gulf War with, with night vision devices. Where we're moving towards now is we've got to take mobility away from the adversary and we've got to take strategic depth or the lack of it away. We have to do that. And we're, we're on that path to do it. But it won't be done at the platform level. 
most of the companies that we're dealing with today that feel like they have strategic advantage going into this downturn are platform agnostic. Their services, their capabilities, their product lines are platform agnostic. They have to be because those are trucks. They're at the basic diminishing returns limit. Doesn't mean we won't produce them, but that's not where advantage is. It's just not there anymore. And all of us that grew up as platform lovers, me being right at the front of that line, have got to figure out how we're gonna make that transition as a culture. Uh, we're about to field the world's greatest fighter you can argue about that 22 versus 35. I, at the end of the day, it's not ready for a world in which there's cyber. It's not ready for a world in which you have huge strategic depth. It's not ready for a world in which stealth is only computational power and that's moving faster than you can field platforms. It's not ready for a world where the weapon systems are speed of light. Okay. That's the world we're moving into. And I, again, I doing airplanes, but, but we can go to, to platforms uh, on the sea and under the sea also. Here. We've got to start to reconcile that. The last part of this thing is grand strategy, which everybody poo-poos today. I got that. But at the end of the day, uh, a wise man once said that all of these wants that you have over here and this resource which is short of that, anything that's a delta is an hallucination. You can dream about what you're going to buy with the money you don't have. Okay? Sometimes we let it be a bow wave for a while, but at the end of the day, it's an hallucination. You're never going to have it because you don't have the resource. And if you just go in and plan for everything and then let the budgeteers decide what you actually buy, which is what we're doing right now, then you don't have what you need when it's time. Okay? You don't have it. And all of those platforms that we're trying to buy, we're going to buy them guessing what the next war is. And then when it's time to find out what that real conflict looks like, we're going to wait three to five years and spend billions of dollars to reconfigure them for the fight we get in. Rather than building trucks, so to speak, and doing that at the speed of computational power, Moore's Law, things like that. I use the, the Reaper as an example, the Predator, when we bought it, it was an analog system. We moved that analog platform to an open architecture, digital. That cost us a little under $300 million to configure all the aircraft, and we did it in less than six months. Then we moved to low def, 720. And now we're at high definition commercial standard. Both of those upgrades still cost less than $300 million, and they were all put in the fleet in less than a year. That's the speed of the war. That's the speed of competitive advantage. That's where we have to be. We cannot do cost-imposing strategies. Sometimes we're going to be forced to do it. Sometimes you will have to buy an MRAP. But understand that you just got beat by the enemy when you do that. That's a cost-imposing strategy on us. We're a wonderful country. We have a lot of resource, or we used to. But if we allow these cost-imposing strategies to continue to stack up on us, we are not going to be what we were. We've got to get real about that. The last piece in this is just a little bit on the demographic side here. But um, as you look at what has happened in, in uh, the, the uh, two conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, you look at what is occurring in the Arab Spring. In that belt that goes around the equator, 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of that, the average age of those countries is somewhere in the neighborhood of less than 20. Okay? And it's just now starting to level off. It had been continuing to grow even through these conflicts. You go north of that, and the average age goes up significantly. Most demographic prognosticators would tell you somewhere around the mid-30s the culture of that country is no longer recoverable. Okay? It's not sustainable. The average age in the United States, 44. Why are we still competitive? Our immigration policy. 
probably the biggest reason. Our diversity, second biggest reason, that came out of that immigration policy. But at that age, if you just count heads, then you vote for health care, you vote for social security, you don't vote for education, you don't vote for national security. Now, I, I'm not telling you that that's, not where, that that's where we're going, but I am telling you that's the norm. Okay? Russia will never see a million man army again, or at least it won't be theirs. Um, you know, this is, this is a real shift that is going on. And that belt of, of countries where the age is less than 20, that age is represented by countries where the wealth is maldistributed, the resources are maldistributed, they're educated, they can't feed their families, and they can't house their families. They have nothing to lose. And they're out there. And maybe Arab Spring will bring to them some satisfaction but if it is a democratic representative of the people type government, we've got one of those, and we're a little over 200 years old, and I wouldn't want them patterning some of the things that we're doing right now uh, like we have. The expectation of a stable government in a democracy is something that is of the 10 and 20 and 30 years in the making. And the significant turnover in who's in charge and these countries were, were somewhat rigid in that there are no more left Luenzas or Nelson Mandela's that are going to pop out of these countries. They made sure of that. So the stability index in that part of the world is very low. So even though we may have a plan that may not survive first contact, in other words, we may think we want to disengage, we may think we want to go we may think we want to save money. The question is, somebody else gets a vote on that. I've been trying to br raise your spirits in this discussion. Um, there are some fantastic things that are happening out there on the technology and innovation side. And I, there's a couple of them, and I always like to end these talks with a couple of, of these kind of vignettes about some of the things that have happened to, particularly to our wounded warriors and in, in that crowd and what science has been able to do for us and what it may have an implication for the broader general society on the medical side in particular. Um, we started a program back in 2005. I, um, I pushed hard on uh, then Tony Tether, who was the head of DARPA, to start working uh, for prosthetics. Uh, it was clear early in the fight that we were going to have problems along those lines. And so we hired a, a, a doctor, a, a PhD in medical type that was an expert in uh, prosthetics by the name of Jeff Lang, and he started a lot of incredible work that has brought this science along. But around 2006, I think it was, uh, I went uh, down to um, Richmond to uh, see an experiment that we were running where we were taking a prosthetic arm that was mechanized and motorized and everything else. And we were taking a nerve out of the chest, hooking it to the arm in order to operate the arm through human thought process. Okay? And uh, we did this with a young naval uh, uh, individual, a uh, young female, 19 years old, uh, yeah, 19 years old, lost the arm in an IED incident. Um, and so we went to do this, and she went through all the prep and everything else and the schooling that came with this. And uh, we did the surgery, and I was there with her parents when she was coming out of post-op and waking up and doing all of those things. And um, the intent was we put a little tennis ball on the table in front of her, and she was to pick the tennis ball up and move it around with the arm, um, which had limited motion. But at least the idea was, could we actually drive that with the thought process? And she woke up, and she knew what she was supposed to do. The ball was sitting there. And you could just see you know, grimace, push, try to make something happen. After about five or ten minutes, it was clear nothing was going to happen. And, of course, the tears are starting to come down, and Mom is crying and whatnot. And in the tears, she moves the hair from her head. You know, and you could have sucked the air out of the room. Um, 
about three years later, with a lot more experimentation, we found that the nerve and moving the nerve was not the way to go. Just the simple placement of a chip against the scalp uh, through the work that we had done, we could do the same thing and do it much more efficiently. And, and I recall in 2010, um, we had a soldier who had lost all four limbs. He'd lost them seven years prior to this, but he was willing to work with us, and so we used the chip and we started working with him. The arm was in the lab in San Diego. He was in um, Walter Reed. And we started working at this thinking that we might be able to use this chip to actually stimulate the brain to do the things that we wanted to do with the arm. And in fact, that's what happened. And so he got pretty good at working his arm, which was in San Diego, um, and moving things around and putting stuff, doing, you know, putting round pegs and round holes and all those types of exercises. Um, a couple of things happened as we did that that we never had any indication of. One of our biggest problems is the brain, when it loses a limb, or even when you just go to sleep, this is the essence of dreams, fills in the blank space of the, of the sensors not being there. So you get phantom pain. That's one of the big challenges that we have is phantom pain. When you put the chip on, the pain stops instantly. The brain believes now it has an arm, a leg, whatever it is. The brain absolutely convinced. So phantom pain goes away. And actually, the absence of phantom pain was how we centralized in to where we wanted to stimulate the brain. So fast forward, we bring the arm back to Walter Reed. We're sitting there. In, now he's got the arm in the same room. It's still not connected to his body. It's sitting over here. And he's moving pegs around. He's sitting in his wheelchair doing this. And his wife is standing right here. Seven years. He reaches over and touches her. First time in seven years. We're starting to make breakthroughs. The first hundred of those arms were, were issued uh, for trial uh, two months ago. Um, we're getting very good at that. We also now have started to understand, because of what we learned here, how we're going to move forward in a lot of different areas. For instance, we took the chip off of a person and put it on a mouse. I'm not sure which of the two were smarter, but, but the mouse we taught to run a maze with a chip on. Then we took the chip off and put it on a second mouse who didn't know how to run the maze and instantly ran the maze. We took the chip off both of them and they still knew how to run the maze. There's something about learning. Think about 10,000 repetitions to be good as an athlete. Think about all the things that you spend time in school learning. What, what are the implications of this? What are the moral implications of this, et cetera? All questions that we're trying to understand. Um, but we have now taken that chip and put it on the scalp for ocular degenerative diseases. In other words, where the nerve behind the eye degenerates, but the eye is still good. And we are now writing software to see. We went past blobology about a year ago. We're now into clear shadows of what's moving around in front of us just by software programming over an, an eye that works and a nerve that doesn't. Think about things like paraplegics, et cetera, the potential that that has. These are things that are several years off, but these are the things that are coming as a result of a lot of the work that has been done as a result of these conflicts. You never want to say war is good, but what we have been able to do in medicine and how far we have advanced over this 10 years is incredible incredible. Um, and the pairing of industry, academia, the hospitals, that, that union has moved medicine so fast, so far, it's unbelievable. Um, and, and to see something like somebody reach over and touch their wife for the first time in seven years, that really gets your emotions pretty quick. A lot of good things happening. My glass is half full. But you really need strategy before you spend money, and what you spend it on needs to be something you can actually afford. And you need to figure out where the upside leverage really is, not what it is you're comfortable in doing at the end of the day. Thank you so much. I'll do question and answer in any direction you want to go. Everybody's feasting on dessert. General Lynn Wells, I'm in to you. Ah, hi, Lynn. 
the, um, the upside potential of the unmanned uh, force you spoke about, uh, unmanned, excuse me, networked force, there's a cybersecurity dimension to this. Uh, and I'm wondering, do you see us in the various steps that are being taken keeping pace with the protection of these systems as we uh, begin to take advantage of their possibilities? Um, as I said, I, my worry is that we built the F-35 with absolutely no protection for it um, from a cyber standpoint. If you go back, you know, I'm, I'll probably go back too far here, but go back 10 or 15, 20 years, um, even to two generations back in aircraft um, or ships or, or uh, ground vehicles, we used to have a switch that we, that we called the MCON switch. But basically it turned off all transmissions out of your vehicle so that somebody could not detect you on the battlefield as you moved around. We need the opposite switch. We need the switch that turns off all apertures now so that we can in fact start to protect ourselves when we go into these kinds of environments. Yet we're not thinking about that. And may, that may not be the answer, but I'll tell you from an, an, a guy who spends his life on the offensive side of cyber, every aperture out there is a target. And if we don't start protecting them, we're going to have a real problem. Um, there is a nexus coming between electronic warfare and cyber. We're having a turf war over it right now as to who's in charge and who's the smarter and all of those things. But at the end of the day, one knocks the door down and the other one goes in and does the dirty work. Um, that's the reality of the battlefield we're going to be in. Um, thinking that for some reason that battlefield, maybe we shouldn't go into cyber, we should un uninvent it and then we won't have this problem, that's, that's unrealistic. I mean, if anything, everybody else is rushing to this solution space. Uh, we're been, we've been a little bit slow in moving in that direction. And we are thinking in military terms, offense and defense. We're thinking 90% defense, 10% offense. That's bass backwards for us. Our job is to kill things and change people's mindset when the nation asks us to do that bidding. And we do that with offense. The offender always has the advantage. We've got to get out of the disadvantageous position of spending all of our time worrying about whether our desktop has got you know, the right firewall in it and start thinking about what it is we're going to do with, with something the equivalent of a hand grenade or an M16 that is actually going to do damage out there. And we've got to do this. I'm going to one more editorial piece on this. This con conversation that's going on about sub-unified versus unified. Okay? Here's my two cents. <laughs> Nobody cares, but here's my two cents. If you go unified right now, I guarantee you we will lose the tactical fight because the services will no longer feel compelled to use their R&D, their capabilities to raise weapons and raise forces and present them to combatant commanders because they won't be filling the bill and they won't have to have the responsibility of the war fight because we'll do it at a strategic level and it won't work. We have got to have tactical forces first then operational, and finally strategic. You can mix and match them once you have them, but nothing replaces the tactical fighter. Nothing replaces the soldier, sailor, airman, and marine at the edge with the weapons necessary to conduct fires, period. No hard, strong feelings on that. Hi, I'm, I'm, uh, my name's Carl Osgood. I write for Executive Intelligence Review. General, you mentioned China and air-sea battle. Uh, and the effect that that's, that's having. Uh, we also have a comparable problem with Russia and missile defense. Uh, the Russians have made very clear in recent days their concerns about our missile defense policy in Europe and that we have not been answering their concerns. Uh, I wonder if you think that we ought to maybe reconsider the strategy we're pursuing with respect to both countries before we find ourselves in a strategic confrontation because of these policies. Sure. Um, at least the, the Russians that I've had the opportunity to have this dialogue with are concerned about two things. They're concerned principally about the potential of what missile defense, either in the strategic sense with protection of the homeland or in the theater sense, which is the defense, the phase adaptive approach. Um, they're worried about two things in general. One is the ability to reach out and touch one of their ICBMs uh, and therefore disrupt the balance of power that exists between the two countries. That's one word. The second is more basic, which is um, the potential that um, you could, in fact, uh, generate a scenario where 
a bolt out of the blue, we do a preemptive attack and then use missile defense to further thin out their re residual fires. I mean, that any good strateg strategy person would figure their way to that solution, okay? Doesn't mean that we intend to do it, it doesn't mean that they intend to do it to us. But if we have missile defense that can, in fact, affect their fires, that strategy would seem to have some merit. We have to think our way through this. We have to figure out how we're going to do this. Most of those assumptions are based on the phase four or the 2B um, missile, which is PowerPoint right now. Um, the question is, should we do that? Well, that's why we called it phase adaptive approach. Maybe we shouldn't. I don't know yet. That's more dialogue that must occur between now and then. But I think you have a very good question. We have to find a solution to it. One more editorial comment on that is that we've got to get out of this bilateral mode in this discussion about arms. Having a discussion about arms and strategic weapons and tactical weapons with just the Russians does not make a lot of sense anymore. They are not our principal enemy, and the likelihood of 300 ICBMs coming over the pole anymore is almost beyond belief. That's not how we solve problems, and that deterrent construct was not terribly effective on 9-11. No strong feelings. Uncle, thank you. Appreciate it. General Curry, we've got a copy of Naval Institute Press, Joe Rochefort's War, a man who changed the war in the Pacific with cryptology 70 years ago. Apropos to the topic, and thank you for your exceptional remarks. Thank you. Thank you.